It's a song, some of you may know it, some of you may not. But um, just try to open up your heart and think about what the lyrics are saying and just pour your heart out to God and bring everything before Him. You can go ahead and stand up. or trial or pain. There is a faith proved of more worth than gold, so refine me, Lord, through the flames. I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain.
through Jesus. It feels so good to be here at home with the one who knows who we are, who sees our hearts, who knows the pain and the tears that we carry, who hears the prayer uh, calls for help because of all the challenges we might face in our lives. God, as we come to you this morning into your presence to praise your name, we also want to bring to you the pain that we carry in our hearts. We have our prayer requests, we have the, um, the things that weigh heavily in our lives, about challenges, about sickness, in our own lives or in the lives of those we love. And so God, we bring those to you. Reach out with your healing hand, heal every sickness. Comfort those who are going through hard times. Help us to see that you have solution for all the problems. But God, we are also so gracious and so happy today because we have seen prayers answered. We, we have seen how awesome you are and how powerful you are and how you intervene into our lives and resolve things that we thought were impossible to go through. And so, God, today we also bring you our praises for all the good things you have done, for keeping us safe, for giving us life every day, for providing for all of our needs, for giving us friends, for giving us this church family, for giving us the strength this morning to be here worshiping together with you and the angels. God, there is no better thought than knowing that we are not alone, that we are part of your household, that we are a member of your family. Thank you, God, for taking the time every week on this special seventh day, the Sabbath, to meet with us and to worship with us and to bless us. May we feel your presence in our hearts and lives today, and may we feel the difference of your spirit is our prayer. Amen. so much. Amen to that song. Amen. Very powerful words. Very powerful words. Very glad that we can be here together once again. I'm glad that I can be back. I was gone, as you probably some of you know, for um, almost two weeks uh, to Bulgaria. I'll give you a little report about my, my country, what I did there, and some of the awesome things that God did for us. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm glad to be here. Now it's time for us to take a moment to... Um, just connect with each other. Uh, we have committed this church family to um, the value of friendships and close relationships. And so as part of that value that we try to live every week of, of um, I mean, every day of every week, we try to practice that during our worship service as well. And so now I want to give you an opportunity just Leave your, uh, stand up from your seats, look across the aisle or right by you, say hello to someone, um, let them know they're welcome, and we will continue with our worship service. Very glad and happy that we're all here today.
Here's the latest news for you from Crosswalk Fellowship. Hey, how would you like to be part of a weekly group who get together to connect with God and with each other, pray together, and take a moment to study the Bible in a meaningful mm -hmm. and relevant way, all in a welcoming environment for your non-church friends? Would you like to bring your acquaintances who are just starting their walk with Jesus to a safe place to learn about God? The missional small groups are for you, and they're being organized this fall. For more information, contact Pastor Boyan at 214-709-3338. You know, nearly everyone has times when stress, worries, or life experiences knock us emotionally off balance. No matter how healthy we feel, depression is a condition that we all experience to some degree. This home seminar is for anyone who'd like to learn how to live an emotionally healthy life through the good or stressful days. Learn how to protect yourself from and deal with signs of depression through this series, Depression, The Way Out, by Dr. Neil Nedley. Plan to attend on Monday nights at 6.30 p.m. at Pastor Boyan and Viara's home in Frisco. For more information, you can give them a call to 1-4-704-8404. There's Children's Church today and every second Sabbath in the youth room for kids ages 4 to 12. There they'll enjoy music, Bible teachings, and fun with other kids their age. Kids over the age of 12 are welcome to help out and volunteer. Join us for Sunshine Band today and every second Sabbath this month. We'll meet at the Frisco Sunrise Senior Living Center from 2 to 3 p.m. That's 2680 Legacy Drive at Legacy and Stonebriar Drive. Do you or your kids have a musical talent you like to share? Do you enjoy ministering to seniors? If you're interested, please contact Debbie White at 972-786-5723. Gen Y and Gen Zers, this is for you, a special praise and worship service for young people, early teens, youth, and collegiates. Next week, October 21st at 2 p.m. here in the church. Pastor Rob Parrish, the NDAA chaplain, will be the guest speaker. There'll be a light lunch, so bring a friend. Hey, it's drive-in movie night. Mark your calendar right now for October 28th. Come and join the fun of watching a movie from your car while being served delicious food by our Pathfinders. The movie's free, and all donations raised from the food sale go toward our Pathfinders account. Locations at the Registers home uh, in Parker, Texas. Vesper starts at 6, the movie at 7. Thanks for supporting the Pathfinders. For more information, contact Betty Bolaños. Betty Bolaños at live.com. Please plan to stay for fellowship after the worship service and then join one of our study groups for kids and adults. Start at 11.45 a.m. Study group locations and topics are available in your bulletin and at the greeter's desk. Here's the latest news. As I mentioned to you, I, um, some of you know that I was gone for um, about yeah, 12 days. I was visiting my country, Bulgaria. I was there to speak at the seminar on uh, how to uh, start new churches on church planting. As you know, I've been helping with that for a few years now here, about four and a half years to help coordinate all the new church startups in the Texas conference. So uh, a little bit through circumstances, um, the people who are organizing the event in Bulgaria ended up uh, having to move. One of them moved to Australia, the other guy could not go, and so they wanted, um, they, uh, the union there reached out and uh, tried to see if uh, me, another friend of mine, can put a team together to go and help with, uh, with that weekend. Um, and so we, um, we did that. Just one second, I'm trying to update this thing here. Um, we did that, we went to uh, Bulgaria, we put together a team of five people and were able to go and visit with over 200 and people, there were about 259 people there the first week and these were all lay people, just members of the church um, who were there with their And uh, trying to see, um, is the, the presentation loaded, guys, into the play playlist? It is? Okay, if um, I might need you to run it uh, there, 
if I uh, don't get to it. Okay. So anyway, um, it was five of us, a guy from New York, a uh, couple of us Bulgarian pastors who have been working with church planting and also um, here in US and also a gentleman from England uh, who I just found out knew my brother uh, kind of by accident. He studied with my brother. I never knew that. And um, also one of the one guy from Austria. We, we all have worked with uh, just um, churches uh, trying to uh, we've been involved in church planting, and so this is the team up front there. Uh, this is the prayer in the beginning. Um, the the guy praying with the microphone is the gent uh, is the, um, the the president of the conference. Bill, if you can take this and just see if you if you guys can bring the pictures because I'll need it for later. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's go to the next picture. Okay. Uh, it was at a very beautiful place up in the mountains. It's where we have our best ski resort. Now, the mountains there, when you go, and it was a bit cloudy of a day, uh, when you go to the mountains, they look really tall. In fact, just behind there in the clouds, in the back is the tallest peak on the Balkan Peninsula. From Bulgaria, Romania, Yugoslavia, Greece, um, and part of Turkey that's on the Balkan Peninsula, um, you have the, the, the tallest peak. It's actually lower elevation-wise than where I used to live when I was in Colorado and Wyoming. I used to live higher than that. But where you, when you're in Bulgaria, Bulgaria is on, the, on sea level, and it looks like so tall. I remember just admiring you know, how beautiful it is as we were uh, hiking up there. Uh, Friday was a beautiful day, by the way. Uh, we got there on Friday. The seminar started on Friday. Um, we, uh, we, we, I was driving up and I thought, well, I'll take pictures on the way back because it's more relaxed. I wanted to go there, be sure everything is set up. Um, I was trying to get there by 2 because the seminar starts at 7, meet with the guys, you know, have the pre-meeting uh, 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 meetings and all that. And so we go there, we start the seminar Saturday evening, and then um, you can just go to the next one. It's hard without seeing it to... Um, Next picture. Okay, keep going. Yeah, these are just pictures. I took those on the way back. You can see the ski slopes up there. Keep going. Um, all right, so here we are Friday night. We started the meeting. Uh, keep, just keep scrolling through. Um, <coughs> you will see we, what we did is we presented the whole concept of why we should plant churches. There was a little wall that you saw a minute ago where people would actually, anytime they felt moved to be a part of a new church plant, they will go and they'll just put their name on a sticky note and put it on the, on the wall. We ended up with over 110 sticky notes out of all the people you see. These are over 250 people there. It was very inspirational and what was very interesting to me is that when I grew up in Bulgaria, right towards the, during communism and right on the edge when communism collapsed, the, the communist system collapsed and atheism collapsed in uh, 89, end of 89, we were planting churches everywhere. Now, what we, what we used to do is, uh, we'll be in the, like I was in the main church and um, like uh, the pastor will say, hey guys, I need four people to go. There is a group of, of, of three uh, Christian, uh, that, uh, three Christians, three Adventist uh, Christians that are meeting in this town next to the capital. Would you guys just go, you know, take a, a, a car full of, of young people and go there and help them for the next, you know, four or six weeks until they, the group grows and it becomes a church. And so we'll do that for actually a full year. The different young, uh, young, young and old actually, it was, it, it was a mixture of, of uh, age groups. We will go through it with the car to those places where there were very few believers. And today there are probably over 12 churches that were started through, through that type of activities. And now there are they're, they're solid churches. You know, for Bulgaria, again, 50 to 60 people churches is uh, 50 to 100 people church is a very good size because um, the, the um, towns and villages are a lot smaller. But um, it, it was pleasure to see that. And yet here I was, about 23 years later, 
talking to the very people from the very country where I learned what church planting is about church planting. Because see what happens over time. When communism collapsed, when atheism was gone, people started feeling that, you know, talking about Christianity is normal. The Western culture went into kind of entered society. And now it's a lot harder to witness. And uh, a, a very few people come into the, the, the church because now they have a lot compared to what they used to. And what happens when our life gets very comfortable? We start thinking, you know what, God, I'll call you when I need you. We use God as a spare tire, right? We pull him out only when we need him. So, you know, it's a lot harder to work. But it was interesting that I had to talk to younger generation of people who don't remember that time about church planting. And one of our appeals with the guy that's speaking there on that picture, Evgeny, who is also Bulgarian, who came to, to the church through, you know, uh, one of these new churches that was planted, we were telling them, guys, we're here to remind you of what God used to do. And I even told them the, the history of there were only two churches in Bulgaria. And they both worshipped in one building because we couldn't buy buildings during communism. So two churches, two different worship services, but they had different, you know, boards and everything, different leadership administration, different pastors. Two churches. This was in 89. Today there are nine churches in the capital and they were all planted from 89 to about 2004 nothing else from well only one church was started from 2004 until today and so so it was it was just interesting you know to hear the uh, i mean to see the the face of the people how you know uh, they, to to see their their amazement about something that they really didn't think much about that many of them were in the church because someone started a new church at a new location to reach out new people who did not know about God or hadn't committed their lives to God. So anyway, it was, it was really an amazing experience and uh, the response was really excellent. Um, they were, um, people were all passionate about it, about it. It was good to see 250 people. We kept them there Friday night from 7 to 9.30. We prayed for every person. These were uh, probably about 160 people that, that uh, stood up and said, we want to be a part of mission, was the first call. We prayed for every single one by name for about 40 minutes. We split them in six groups, and they'll patiently wait for us to, to like, uh, take two of them and, and pray by name for each and every one of them. Amazing experience, passionate about Jesus. Um, this was, by the way, where we were. Um, in the, the hotel there. Uh, this is the, the, on Friday. At least I was able to get a picture of the hotel. Um, and so we have that meeting on Saturday. We had them there from 8.30 in the morning all the way until 9 o'clock at night with, with breaks for, I mean, we had breaks, of course, uh, but we all, and we had the meal breaks. But these people were there just hungry to to refocus, to hear uh, ideas of how can they revive the mission of Jesus in the very country that I was, uh, I grew up in, that was a, a leader in in uh, in church growth. Interesting how time changes, right? Makes me think about us. How many of us came to in the church because someone ventured into a new area? reached out to your family or to you and made the difference to bring you into a saving relationship with Jesus. And yet we are so comfortable sometimes sitting right here at church that we forget to reach out and make a difference in the life of others. Well, we woke up the next day and I thought, well, maybe we'll go out to, on a walk. And guess what? There were over four and a half inches of snow, and this is good snow, and it snowed the whole day. By the end of the day, there were close to seven inches of snow. It, will kind of, it, it wasn't the, the, the huge chunk of snow that fall, but it was a great snow for snowball fights. So we did go in the evening, uh, go, go out in the evening and the next day. Here is the next day we're walking, and we had a snowball fight. Of course, the weather was, is still pretty warm, so the snow didn't stay there too much. Um, just a few pictures there from our walk. Then after the, the, the on uh, Sunday morning, we had some seminars on different topics. 
And um, I showed picture of you, by the way, our congregation, because I was uh, talking about worship and also community outreach. Uh, so shared some of our story as, as a crosswalk congregation. Then on uh, Sunday at noon, one of our speakers said, you know what? Can you please take us out to eat somewhere? Because we are tired of eating the food here. Bulgarian food, by the way, is delicious. But the restaurant there was asked to cook vegetarian food because there were a lot of people who would not, uh, did not eat uh, uh, meat. You know, there was the preference there, and it's, and it's safer. So when you feed like a huge group, uh, groups of people, but the, the place didn't know how to cook uh, vegetarian food too well. So usually you'll get a salad almost every day of tomatoes and cucumbers, delicious tomatoes and cucumbers. I mean, uh, Bulgarian tomato, I, I love eating it like an apple. That's how delicious it is. But you get tired of it, right? You eat it for, uh, every day for lunch and supper, and, and you know, it's, it gets tiring. And usually the food will be, they'll serve three things. They'll serve this uh, yellow, uh, yellow cheese that's uh, bread, uh, breaded. Uh, in, uh, in like eggs and uh, flour um, and I cannot eat it because I'm not used to eating that much of that's a typical Bulgarian food but it's heavy because it's, uh, it's, it's yellow cheese I mean it's, it's a big chunk of it too then they will do these peppers with, uh, with feta cheese inside which again I used to love and now I can't really eat feta cheese that much neither could my, my foreign friends and so they said, listen, oh, and the third one was good, actually. Uh, a special patties made out of potatoes. They're huge, you know. It, th that was delicious. Everyone liked that. The guy goes, hey, let's go and eat somewhere. So we took him to a nearby restaurant. Um, great service. Uh, poor girl there. We were so hungry. We ordered, literally, we probably ordered about 13 or 14 things for, seven peop for six people. 14 different dishes. You know, we wanted to try everything and very patient service. Uh, uh, we, this is Steve, my buddy, who wanted to, to just um, um, uh, have different food. Well, what happens is the next day, we actually um, had a meeting with all the pastors. So we continued the church planting training of how to start new churches. You know, um, some of the, the uh, lessons we have learned here in Texas. Uh, since we have planted over 140 churches since year 2000 in the Adventist Church. We have uh, 300 churches today, plus about 80 church planting groups or companies. Um, and just in the last four years, since I've been helping, we have planted 46 churches. Okay? When I say they might not have reached the church status, but 46 new groups have uh, started in new locations or new demographic groups. So there is a lot to share from the experience, from the mistakes we've made, from failures, from successes. So here we are, you know, talking to the pastors, um, 50 pastors. Over, uh, uh, We had uh, 19 of them said that they will plant a church in the next year. Amen. I mean, that was amazing. 19 of 50 pastors said, no, we're going to do this in the next year. We have a place, we know of a, of a little town or, a, or an area in our city where we can start a new group for, for Jesus. Um, and, and another 24 said that they will plant a church in the next two years. It was extremely great. I mean, it was fun to see all the people responding. We had them work in, uh, in uh, groups. Um, uh, just doing a little, uh, little exercises, uh, going through what a planting core team will go through as they start new churches. Um, here is me uh, leading that, that section. So um, we finish with that. And then my friend Steve, again, this is the next day. Uh, Sunday was the first day in that restaurant. On Monday, he said, let's go eat out again. I don't want to I can't eat this food, okay? He loved it, by the way, in the capital. He came to my place, you know, I mean, he loved the rest of the food, but that cafeteria just was not, uh, was not working for him and for me either. So they go to eat in the restaurant on Monday at noon, and uh, two of the guys wanted to talk to me. So I told them, okay, guys, uh, you know, all the speakers, they went down to the restaurant. I stayed there. Guess what they served for lunch? They decided to change the menu. So it was a very nice uh, uh, cabbage salad with beets and, uh, and carrots. And I mean, it was, it was just delicious. Guess what? Steve loves cabbage salad. 
And so, and then they served the main dish was this, uh, this uh, dish like a stew with potatoes and, and, um, and uh, green, green peas and um, just, just, just delicious. So, you know, I, I called the guys up and I'm like, guys, you don't know what you're missing. You went to a restaurant right when they started serving a different good food. So they came back, we joked about it, you know, that I had better lunch or as good of lunch as them for free, you know. And so then in the evening, they said, okay, we're going to stay tonight. Maybe they'll change the menu. Nope. It was the same thing. It was really fun. Anyway, but um, I'm sharing that because, you know, sometimes we try to, like, do things in life and, and we think we can outsmart life. But there are times when God just wants us to keep going the direction He is leading us. Because we'll be surprised at what will be served. And what we also realized, you know, with these guys who gave from their time, they, they were there seven days, all of them are extremely busy, they work, you know, for conferences, they run departments, and um, what I also learned is none of them, despite the food, you know, complained about anything. They were committed every day to mentor others of how to win people for Jesus, how to win mission, missional lives. And so our, our dream is, we prayed, by the way, we had a beautiful communion service that evening. The lady, the cook in that restaurant where we went to, we needed communion bread. And most of you know that communion bread is special made bread. Um, it doesn't have yeast. It's only water, flour, uh, uh, salt, and uh, olive oil. Okay, that's the biblical way of making communion bread without the yeast and, and leaven in it. And so we didn't have a place to buy it from. We went to the lady at the restaurant. We said, can you make some? She said, sure I can. Yeah, that sounds easy. Well, you know, can you make it for 60 people? She smiled. She said, I can. And she did. She made this beautiful bread. And she made it, by the way, usually people who make communion bread, they make it thin. But in the time of Jesus, it was really thick, Okay. And so sh this lady made it the way it is supposed to be thick. So when you get the piece, it's like a real piece of bread, you know. So um, it, was, it was really beautiful and really awesome. The whole message, and what I wanted to share with you, is the whole message for the whole weekend and the work with the pastor was this, pastors was this. If we forget to be missional, which means to go out, reach out to new people in new areas or in new demographic groups, we have failed to fulfill the mission of Jesus and the passion of Jesus to save people who are lost, who have, don't, don't have a saving relationship with him, to bring them back in his family. And so we need to get that passion back in our hearts to be missional, to live missional lives. Every day when I walk out of, of home to remember that I'm there to make a difference in the life of others, to show them Jesus, to show them what it means to care for them and as well to l bring them so they can get to know him so they can start believing in him and have eternal life i want to finish with just one more um, one more story we come back to the capital and we decided to take the speakers out through the capital city and we go to this little uh, little church now, this, uh, it, it's hard to see here, but it's surrounding by, by uh, some of the main uh, arteries, like, uh, I mean, uh, streets in Sofia. And the metro, the subway stations are all around that, that area. You know, I didn't get a, like a 360 view of it. Behind this place, if you see the little building with the, the, lit, the, um, sti the what do you call Spile, yeah, uh, just, just up in the air. That used to be the communist building, the main communist building. Now is the, um, the, um, the offices for the House of Representatives there. On the left is the, are all the, um, the, uh, the prime minister's place, and, and his offices on the right is the presidency, the building you see there. So this is a very central place, is my point, for this little church. It's very small. So we come here and we go to the front, and the front is actually, the front door is closed. But we could hear a choir singing inside. Beautiful choir, so we decided we gotta get in. So we go to the side, we saw that um, on, on this side, um, you'll see a gentleman with a blue shirt going down. There is a little door, so we go in there and there is a little shop where you can shop and buy the lit, uh, like icons and, uh, and just, uh, um, 
uh, relics, I guess, or, or uh, little items that, that have spiritual meaning. And so we go through the door, and there are stairs, and we want to go through, this, through, through the stairs all the way up to the top where the worship service is going with the beautiful choir. Ricardo, you would have loved it. I mean, really, really good. And good acoustics and stuff. And so we want to go, and the lady just stands there, and she says, um, are you Orthodox believers? This is like the Catholics the, in Bulgaria. It's the Eastern Orthodox. Are you or members of the Orthodox Church? We said no. And she said, well, we, I cannot let you in. This is only for Orthodox people to participate in the worship. We said, but we are Christians. We love Jesus. I'm a pastor. My friend said, he's a pastor too. Can we go? She said, no. The, the priest said, no one who is not a member of this church can go up there and participate in the worship. You know, I really took a picture of this place to remind me that many times we're so comfortable here having worship together and being a church that we treat people outside the church that way. This place is for us. If you're not a member of Crosswalk, you can't, you can't come in. If you're not a Christian, you can't come in. If we remember that we are here to be, Jesus said, you don't take a light and put it under a bushel, right? Because it's supposed to give light. We are the light of, to the world, Jesus said. We are the soul to the world. In the middle of Sofia, about, you know, three million people city, with so many people coming by in this central area, which is the, the most, uh, uh, one of the, the, the heavy, heavy uh, attended tourist area. You have a church with beautiful choir, with closed doors. And when people try to get in, they're told, you can't. That's not for you. As we reach to our community here, are we going to be missional? Are we going to be thinking about not just uh, uh, letting the people come in who find us, but open the doors, be outside, invite people to come into the family of God right here at Crosswalk? Or are we going to be people who come, who worship, do their thing, and then just go home, and that's it? I hope that this is encouraging to you. Um, have a lot more... Um, stories to share. We'll do it over the next few weeks as we uh, do some of our studies and our messages every Saturday. But remember, God has called us to be missionaries. And when I saw the passion of the people, they are ready, over 250 people ready to go out and turn Bulgaria upside down to win people for Jesus. I thought, man, I want to see that same thing in me as I come back. And I hope that you do too. We could have the lyrics for Even So Come on the screen, please.
hear a testimony from KD8. Good morning, church. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, my name is Katie Eights, and I've been, we've been coming to this church for eight years. Um, some of you that know me noticed that for the month of September, I wasn't at church. And there's a bit of a story that goes with that. And that story comes with a witness testimony because God is so gracious and merciful. So the story starts, on a Wednesday, I was going to go to a lunch with my daughter, but I had to get some stamps. Now, most of you know that I watch Stephen, Leah's son. So Stephen and I were going to lunch with, Le with Ashley, and we stopped at the post office. We walked into the post office with no problem. We waited in line, we bought the stamps, and I realized we were really behind schedule. So I scooped up Stephen and walked out the wrong door at the post office and walked directly to my van. Now, that was my first mistake. I should have never picked up the two-year-old. I should let the two-year-old walk because then I would have been more careful about where we walked because I wouldn't want the two-year-old to fall down and get hurt. What happened? I didn't see the handicap access ramp. And so with both of my feet on the curb, I rolled off, sprained both of my ankles, and fell. And it hurt really, really bad. But God was merciful because I didn't scream. I cried, I yelled, but I didn't scream. 
I remember starting to roll off the curb, and the next thing I know, I'm very calmly putting Stephen up at the end of the ramp. And he's looking at me kind of confused, but he's not hurt. The two-year-old that I was carrying wasn't hurt. So I'm laying on my back, yelling, praying to God, because in my mind, I'm there by myself, only with God's help, and I have to take care of this two-year-old. So some strangers walked up and asked if I was okay and what could they do for me, and I talked with them. Now, those of you who know Stephen will know this is a miracle. He didn't scream at them. He didn't get up and run away. He didn't cry. He didn't throw any temper tantrum. He just sat quietly while I talked to the strangers. Now, he did let it know that he didn't want anyone too close to him because when someone stepped a little closer, he let them know. But when they backed up, he got quiet again. So they were talking to me about, well, you know, should we get you an ambulance? You know, that looks pretty bad. We should get you an ambulance. I said, no, no, I can't have an ambulance. You can't call an ambulance. Because in my mind, I have to take care of Stephen. Who's Stephen going to go to if they put me in an ambulance? Because they can't take Stephen in the ambulance. So they said, okay, so what can we do? I said, I just need you to help me to get to my van. If I can get to my van, everything will be okay. They didn't like the idea, but again, there was a blessing. Here are these strangers helping me stand up, picking up my bag, walking me to the van. Again, another miracle. Stephen stands up. I said, we have to go to the van. He said, okay. He walked to the van without a problem. I open the van. I ask him to get up in his seat. Right away, he does. I buckle him in. The, most of the strangers walked away right away. There was this one elderly lady. She's like, are you sure? Are you really sure? I'm like, I, I have to take care of him. She said, okay, make sure you drive home slowly. Don't hurry. Just take your time. I said, yes, ma'am. So I got in the car, got in the van, shut the door, and I called my Ashley to tell her, I'm sorry, we're not going to have lunch today. She said, why? So I explained to her. She said, okay, Mama, I can't come to you because Michael's at work, but you need to call Teresa. She's my other daughter, those of you who know. I have two daughters, Ashley and Teresa. Teresa's the older one, Ashley's the younger one. I said, okay, I will do that. So I got off the phone with Ashley, and I called Teresa. My loving Teresa, who I woke up with this phone call, went from, hi, Mama, to, what did you say? This is what happened. She said, okay, I'm at Wes's. Wes and I will come to you. Where are we supposed to meet you? I said, no, 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 you don't have to come here. Meet me at the house because I can get the car, I can get the van in the garage, but I can't get me and, me and Stephen in from the van to the house. She said, okay, you go there, we'll meet you there. So very carefully, I drive home. I pull into the garage, and again, Stephen's calm. He asks for some waiting toys, which is something I have in the van, and we just sat there. And he was calm, we listened to Veggie Tales, we sang, we talked a little bit. My ankles are crazy hurting. My right ankle in particular had started to bleed at the post office. So I put a Band-Aid on it that I had in my purse and I'm like, I just don't want any blood in the van. So, sometime later, here comes Teresa and Wes and they walk in like the Calvary. Teresa's calm, she's controlled, she is the adult of the situation. It was amazing. She walked up, she talked to Stephen. Stephen's like, okay, yeah, whatever. And he just gets out of the car and walks with her. Wes, her friend, is amazing because he walks around to the van and he is basically my crutch, helping me all the way into the house. For the next five hours, these people are helping me. They're doing anything they think I need and everything I ask them. They are talking with me so that I can be calm and think through this thing clearly because unfortunately, when I'm in pain, my brain doesn't work really well. I still haven't called Leah. Leah's in Denton at work. Who's going to take care of Stephen? We have to call Leah. We'll speed things up a little bit. They take me to the emergency room. 
they're very afraid I have a broken ankle, not just a sprained ankle. So they take x-rays. God is merciful. I only have a sprained ankle, both of them. But I have a wound on my right ankle. They see me through the emergency room experience. They take me home. They're staying with me a little bit longer. And then Teresa has to go to class. So the next day, I called um, some church members who is a physical therapist who has helped me with an injury of mine in the past. I call him. I say, OK, this is what happened. He's like, I'll be there. When he comes, I get a lecture for not calling him the day before when it first happened. He's like, OK, this is what we're going to do. So without asking anything from me, he does everything he can to help me get better. He then proceeds to keep doing that through the month of September to help me get better. He never asks for anything. He takes time out of his life to come to my house, do these things for me, and then go. Well, after two weeks, he says to me, you need to go see your doctor because that doesn't look good. And he's talking about the wound on the outside of my right ankle. We go to the doctor. The doctor says, yep, that's infected. OK, these are the people you need to go see. We go see a wound specialist. The wound specialist says, yeah, that looks bad. Let's take a swab of that and set a culture on it. What's happening? I don't have an infection. I have a fungal infection in my ankle. And it's, an, it's a rare type of fungus that's normally only seen in construction work or in South America. I've never been out of Texas, what, for the last year or two. So again, God is doing things to take care of me. My husband stayed home from work, took time off of work for two weeks to help us take care of Stephen so that Leah could go to work and make the money to take care of her family. Oh my gosh. When Kevin couldn't stay at home anymore because he had to get back to work, my daughter Ashley came and stayed for a week, neglecting her new husband and her household to help me get better. While she was there, she helped me work on being able to stand and being able to walk around. So almost two months later, I am here to tell you that God takes care of you. God takes care of you by having other people come and help you when you are in your worst time. So when you think you're in your worst time, remember to pray and then remember to thank him because he is there and he will take care of you. You know, we often take for granted the things God does every day. And it's when we have some major failure, or I guess major injury, I should say. Uh, I used failure intentionally, the word, yeah. Failure in, in what happens to us, I guess. We end up searching for God because, again, we realize that He is the one who protected us and who kept us safe and, and so on. Um, I was just, you know, we traveled quite a bit in Bulgaria uh, before and after the seminar, drove for quite a while. And on the way back, um, after I came back, I went with my dad. He was doing a, an evangelistic meeting in um, one of the churches where I grew up. Uh, it was fun to see it. Um, but just as we got there, we got the news that uh, one of the ladies who has gone to church there for over 30 years had a car accident and was killed. You know, and I, I didn't think much about all of our travel because, again, it's, it's just normal, right? And yet we realize that um, God is there and He protects us um, from sometimes the worst happening. Amen. We have been talking about ink, right? This is our overall theme. And in the fall, we decided that what we will do is uh, we will look at 
the blueprint of God's um, design for mine and your house, quote unquote, dream house, which is our lives. You know, we have all experienced what it means to have a home. I'm not saying that we all own our home, but we all have a place that we call home, right? So I was in Bulgaria, as uh, you know, I was with my parents, and the very first day I was there, I uh, have this, I hope you might laugh at this, but if I have like a favorite pair of socks that I really like and I don't want to throw away until they are really worn out, and they get holes on them, okay? Then what I do is I wait for a trip when I can put them on, I can wear them for one last time, and then I throw them away, right? No wash anymore because they're holes. So um, I had a pair of socks that I really liked. And uh, this is not it, by the way. I did not take a picture of this. this is, um, those are not my feet. My socks were better than this, okay? But anyway, we were in Bulgaria, and I'm sitting there first night with my mom, and my cousin comes over, and I like keeping my feet up on either the recliner or on the little coffee table. And so I had my feet up, and my, my cousins walked in, and I remembered to put them down because down on the bottom, they didn't look, they actually looked worse than this. They were two big holes. So I put them down, and you know, but I can't sit like this, so you know, I put my foot up on the couch, but always trying to hide, you know, the holes. And and uh, my cousin came with his wife and uh, his niece um, Raya. Some of you guys will remember the younger people. She has been here to visit us. And then all of a sudden, I mean, all of a sudden, we, we finished. They went home. And I take my feet and put them on the table. And my mom says, "Do you know your holes? Uh, your socks have holes." My mom is very particular about that since we were little kids. And I said, yeah. She's like, well, why are you wearing them? And I'm like, it's just the first day I'm going to throw them after tonight. But what was interesting is I was very uncomfortable showing my holy socks to my cousin. And yet I was totally comfortable sitting in the living room with my feet up and have my mom see the imperfect clothing I was wearing. See, we have been talking about God's bl blueprint for our house, and um, the first time we talked about foundation, which is the foundation of the house, which is God. The second time we talked about the framing of the house, the outside walls, the external uh, frame of the house, which is the beliefs, yes, of, of, of God, the fundamental uh, teachings of the Bible, the, the doctrines of the Bible, which help us build our character and the framework in which all of our lives are lived as well as protect us from the outside, you know, uh, influence in the world. And then we, we talked about the kitchen, right? What we eat matters. And spiritually, what we feed ourselves on is crucial to how well we will feel in our spiritual lives. Amen. Today we move to the next house, and that is the place where we are ourselves, the living room. In fact, I entitled it, The Living Room, It Is I. In other words, I come home into the living room after a busy day of work. And guess what I do? There, there are two things actually we usually do depending on, on, uh, on how tired you are and depending on your personality. One of the things I like doing as soon as I get home is go change into like some home clothes and then you know go and sit right there in the living room you know in, in my living room and, and just enjoy the evening I'm done what do you say vegetating veg okay that that's you know just some of us like going home we stay in, in our clothes right uh, from work but we loosen the tie we maybe tuck, take the shirt out we kick our shoes off and then we sit down kind of, you know, saying the day is over, I can be myself, right? Independently of which category you fall into, it is the living room is the place when we go home where we sit down and we relax, letting ourselves be who we really are. Again, I was, I, I told you the story, I was with my parents, I had my feet up, I had the holes on my socks, but I didn't care, you know why? 
because I was home. I was in the place where I didn't have any more to pretend uh, and let people know how good I am and let people know how you know, well-dressed I am. I didn't have to be defined anymore by my clothing, my, my um, demeanor, my, my, the words I use, what I say, you know, how I look, my hair is messy. I don't care. I am at home where I can be who I really am. The living room is the place where we know who we really are. See, when we are back at home, when we sit down in the living room, pretty soon something else happens. Let's say I got home the earliest from everyone. What happens, you know, in a few minutes? They all join us. Our families, our kids come from school. Our uh, spouses come from work. They come and what do they do? Same thing as we did. They come, they throw the bag, and if you're like Timmy, I keep telling him, put your bag away. He just leaves it by the door, leaves his shoes, comes and plops himself there on the couch. Because the living room is where we become, I mean, we, we, we let ourselves be who we are. I don't have to pretend anymore. I don't have to worry about it anymore. I can just be there and be myself. See, because I assume and I believe and I live with the impression and with the conviction that the people at home are my friends. My family are my friends. They would love me independently of what I look like. No matter how ugly of clothes I wear, they will just love me because they're glad to see me home. In our spiritual lives, we find uh, Apostle, um, Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. We, pi we find him talking to us about who he is, about what he really, how he really feels about himself. While we're putting it on the screen, Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, I want to uh, remind you that the, the church in Rome had become Paul's, um, Paul's special community of people. And the reason for that is because he had been there more than one time. He was prisoner there, and part of these people who, who became the Church of Rome were people who had come and helped Paul when he was sit, sitting in his prison uh, uh, house there. And then afterwards, when he visited them, they were the people who really had reached out and, and helped him. So he loved them, and he felt like he is at home. And so here are the words that uh, he says in Romans chapter 7. Verses 14 through 25. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. I listen to Paul here, and I hear the cry of someone who is wrestling with his own sinful nature. 
Paul, Apostle Paul, the one who is absolutely the, the, um, the, uh, the, the model of, of what it means to be a follower of Christ. The one who could come in the living room and when he enters the living room, everyone from the family will look at and say, man, we admire you, we want to hear what you will say. He drops down his guard and what does he say? You know what? I struggle in life. The good I want to do, I don't do. Not too long ago, I remember about four weeks ago, we had a game with my, with my soccer team here in town um, in, in the McKinney Soccer League. And I remember there was a guy who was playing me really dirty and I got tired of it. And so I started pushing him too. And then he got even worse, you know. So I finally said, ref, you got to watch this guy. But I made it so everyone will hear it. So he stops. I didn't do it in a mean way, but then I thought afterwards, I remember going home, sitting down on the couch after the soccer game. My wife plays with me too, so she sat down. The kids were there, and I was just saying, you know what? I kind of feel embarrassed of what I did at the soccer field. Imagine that all these people that heard me complaining about, you know, this guy playing dirty, saw me that I played him dirty after that too because of what he was doing. But when he crossed the line, I kind of complained about him. Imagine that they know that I'm a pastor. Or even worse, I, my son had told me that one of his, the, the fathers of one of his, of, of his uh, classmates plays on that team. And I had to go to Tim and say, okay, tell me what he looks like. I hope it wasn't this guy. Because if I see him at the next birthday, it will be uncomfortable, right? But you know what? It, it felt so good to go home. Drop my guard down and like Paul say, you know what? I mess up too sometimes. First question for our talk today about considering the, the living room. Is it a place where you can really comfortably say who you are and what your struggles are? Is your living room a place where it is safe to just open up, not just you, but those around you too? Is it a place where you can openly say what you are struggling with without feeling somehow that the other people might not accept you and might not love you? The living room of our lives, my friends, is just actually many times exactly the living room of our houses where we live where we show who we really are so do you like who you are when you are in your living room after the day is over when you don't care anymore what others think about you when you don't care anymore to put up the face to wear the nice clothing when you everyone can see all of yours imperfections there are a few types of living rooms. Some of them, the way they are set up, show if they are a living room that really is, um, is uh, designed for conversations, right? What is the center of your living room tells a lot about what goes on in there. You know, when you look at this living room, what is the center of this living room? The fireplace, right? So I assume that most people who sit down in this area do what? They like chilling, just looking at the fireplace, not at each other as much. That doesn't mean they cannot communicate, but the focal point is not each other. Now, there is another living room. What does this, does this living room tell you about the people who live there? Sorry? Conversations, why? What's different in this living room? All of the seats point towards each other. That means when we go and we, we kick our shoes off and we sit down and we are ourselves, we are there to talk together. And then there is this one that you already saw on the screen, right? What is the center? I go home, I kick off my shoes, I, I, I undress, I, I be, I, you know, I'm, I'm who I am, but my attention is not on other people but on the news. As we think of our living rooms, 
What is the environment that we are creating? The second important point I want us to consider is that if people don't feel like they, someone wants to listen to them, that, they are, that someone cares that they can open up to somebody, they will not have the open conversations in the living room. There are times when I remember, you know, um, either my wife or my daughter will come home and, or Timmy, you know, and I'm in the living room, I have the TV on, and even though our seating is such that, you know, you can face each other um, on, on most of the seats, you know, I, they, I'm so into the, just hearing the news because I just got home, that they come home and they don't share what went on during the day. What happens is, few hours later, I go to her room or to his room, and that's when they open up and say, Dad, you know what happened today? Dad, you know what the teacher said today? Dad, do you remember that box we worked on so hard for three hours that it didn't follow me to the car today and it stayed on the kitchen countertop? And I got in trouble because I didn't have my project there. Dad, you know what? See, there is nothing better than a place where uh, an environment where uh, we, an environment that is designed for us to connect and communicate and open up with each other. Where, like Paul, we can say, "Wretched man I am, who can help me overcome my my challenges?" A place where, like David, we can share the cry of our heart. Psalm 32, verses five through seven. Psalm 32, verses 5 through 7, we read a place where David was, was um, uh, sharing a prayer that revealed the condition of, of his heart. Psalm 32, verses 5 through 7. Then I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity, says David. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely, the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Can you imagine going home in your living room and not only sharing, you know, your struggles throughout the day, but actually share the spiritual heaviness that you carry with you? To look at your kids, to look at your spouse, to say, you know what? My heart is heavy because I feel like I'm just not growing. I feel like I'm praying and I'm not hearing God answer that deep prayer of my heart. See, many times what happens in the living room is a revelation of, of the relationships that we have with others and the environment we have created because many times people don't want to come and sit in the living room because the only thing they see is that when they come and they try to talk to us, the attention is drawn somewhere. And instead of people talking with each other, we have this. One is working on their computer. By the way, you don't need a TV for nothing to happen in your living room. The person is working, both parents are working on their computer. The kid, he's working on his stuff. Because see, no one is, is interested to talk to each other because maybe there is no self, safe environment there. So the first question was, are you comfortable with who you are when you're in your living room and you, are, you drop all of your guards down? Do you like who you are? The second question is, when we are in our living rooms, do we create an environment where others can share an environment that fosters relationships. Where your spouse could tell you what happened. Not to get an advice, but just to share. When your kids could, could, um, 
could open up and, and give you the insights of, of, of the life, that, of what they experienced in their life today. Of what happened with school, about the, 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 the tests that they took, about the, the relationships they're trying to, they, they try to get involved in. But see, but the question is not only on personal level and on our home, on the level of our homes. The question is deeper than that. Because the bigger question is, what about this home? What about this living room? Of Crosswalk Fellowship. When we come here, do we feel an environment where we can all share? Where we, we can um, open up? Where our personal lives and the struggles we go through will find someone that cares and can listen to us? Especially those of us who don't have anyone else in our own homes because we live by ourselves. See, God wants us to live in unity. But unity is possible only when each one of us finds a place where we can open up and share. Where we feel we are among friends who care, friends who really um, want to know what's going on in our lives, friends who love us unconditionally. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, by the way, I love the books of, of uh, 1 John because it's one of the places where J uh, John, uh, the apostle of Jesus, emphasizes this very question. So 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, How great is the love the Father has lavished us that we should be called children of God, and this is who we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. We are all children, and children live when they're younger in the same household, right? So John is saying we are all children of God. God has given us this privilege to be called children, His children, right here at Crosswalk. This is our living room. This is the time, this is the place where we come and we hope we can reach out and be ourselves and share with others what is deep in our hearts. Of course, it doesn't happen in the worship service, right? That's not where we talk. It happens afterwards in the, in the little huddles that form in the foyer. It happens in the groups that get together to study the Bible where we share our, you know, uh, where we pray for each other. And by the way, that's why we're working on starting small groups. If you're interested to lead one or be a part of one, come and talk to me or, or uh, uh, David and Lola. Um, we've introduced David a few times here. But just let us know. We want to create these communities where we can open up and be ourselves when we can share the deepest struggles from our lives. Because here is what happens in 1 John, the following chapter, chapter 4. 1 John 4, verses 7 through 12, and then verse 20, we find out the call of John regarding what our community needs to become, what our family, our living room needs to be. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son an anointing sacrifice for our sins. And then the last two verses, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And then in verse 20, it says, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. So, do you like who you are when you go into your living room with your family? 
and they can see you because they know you. You can't pretend anymore. But do you also work to create an environment where when your family comes and sits around you, they see someone who cares to listen to them? Because as John said, unless we love each other, we really are not a reflection of God. When you talk to your church members, do you feel that they love you? To your fellow church members here? But you know when they will, uh, you will feel that you are loved? When you start living in a way that shows that you love others. Because if each and every one of us starts living in a way that shows that we care for others by taking the time to listen to them rather than rushing home, by inviting them over for a small group or just maybe a meal, by, by trying to intentionally connect with those around us, we will feel like we are one awesome home. We will look forward to go to the living room and kick our shoes off and say, you know what, here is what happened with me today. I want to share with you, Dad. You know, there is nothing better than a story told to you by your kids. And sometimes they go through details. I know my mother-in-law sometimes laughs at the way Tim te uh, Timmy um, shares, you know, what happened in the day. He goes through so many details. And, and she looks at me like, man, you're so patient to listen to all of that. I love it. I love it that he is sharing with me what happened. God says, you know what? That's what I created the church to be. You got to love it to share what's going on in your life, good and bad, because we are here to pray for each other. For see, God wanted us through sharing to become one united family. And as we become one united family, he wanted the world to know that we are his disciples. Amen. See, God wants his children who are in the world around us to come and feel that they can become a part of his family, part of the church family, part of the family they have lost as they return back to the communities of faith that we have found in every one of our churches. I want to finish with John chapter 13. John 13. Um, by verse 34 and 35. This is Peter hanging out with Jesus and Peter is, you know, bragging about how he's going to stand with Jesus no matter what. And Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, you got to be humbled because you will deny me before uh, this night is over. And, uh, and this is what Jesus says. Um, A new command I give you Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I want to finish with the conclusion why this is so important. See, many times I go home after a day and I think about the bad things that happened that I did in my, my daily activities. And I don't like everything. And I share it with my family. And you know what? I don't want to be that dad that comes home and says, man, I lost it today. And if people knew I'm a pastor and they come to church and they try to listen to me, they probably will walk out because they're going to say, oh, that's the guy I saw today. Right? We all go through those moments, right? But see, if you have a loving family, what can you do? You can say, you know what, but Jesus, he tells me that he can help me. He tells me that he can, he can change me. And when I come here, I can share all this stuff with you guys because I know that you will pray for me. Do you like who you are when you are in the living room 
of your house. And if you don't, is the environment self enough, uh, I mean, safe enough that you can share what is really deeply into your heart, the way Paul shared with the church in Rome that he is struggling, doing the things he doesn't want to do versus the things he really longs to do. And he says, I'm the worst of all, the greatest sinner who can help me. Because if there is love in the home, we will not only open up, but we'll find an environment where others will pray and God will give us an opportunity or we will give an opportunity to God to change who we are. See, the living room is who you are, but it doesn't have to stay that way, right? It can become the place where you change and are transformed to who you want to be. When those around you love you, when they're ready to hug you and pray with you and say, we love you about who you are, but you know, you got to change. You know that it's better. You know that you can be better than this. It feels good. Because instead of being judged, I'm encouraged to grow and become the person God wants me to be. Three main questions. Do you like who you are when you're in your living room? Is it, do you help create an environment of love where you can openly share your struggles as children of God? And finally, is it the place where you and I, in a loving environment, can be changed and be transformed. I guess I'm sorry, I'm going to read one more text. John 17, verses, uh, and I'm going to shorten it. Um, let's read John 17, verses 13 through 19. John 17, verses 13 through 19. I am coming to you now. This is Jesus praying to, to his Father in heaven in the presence of his disciples. He says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they, referring to the disciples, may have the full measure of my joy with them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My, pra my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth, for your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I, san uh, for them I sanctify myself, so they too may be fully sanctified. And then it says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you saved me. Jesus' prayer was that we all become one and we will become one when we can come and feel comfortable about who we are, come as we are. Pray each other in a loving environment and help each other to become who he wants us to be. What does your living room look like? Is it a place where you are loved even when your socks have holes or you fall asleep while you're talking to, to your, your relatives and they know that you are tired and rather than judging you, they just love you for who you are? Is your living room an environment where you feel comfortable to share and others feel comfortable to share what is in their heart? And is it a place where because of that loving environment, you and them can grow and become more and more of who God wants them to be? 
for God's plan for your living room is to be the best place where you can walk in the way you are and be encouraged to grow in the way he wants you to be. Would you help make the church, your home, a place like God's ideal living room?
Dear Jesus, how can it be that you can take our wrongs and make it right, that you can make us feel like we are in a living room with a family that cares so much for us? You've modeled that, God, what it means to come into your presence and open up, be the way I am, because I will feel an understanding love and because I'll find someone who cares to pray with me, to help me along to change so I can be who I really want to be. God, we pray that you will make our homes, our living rooms, a loving and nurturing environment where families will become one, where they will enjoy pouring out what they're feeling because they know that they'll be loved no matter how bad they've messed up, because they know that their joys will be shared. God, help us to make not only our living rooms at home be that, but also our churches. So everyone and each one of us who is here can walk in the church family. Be ourselves, be loved with our socks, with the holes on them. And yet find family that will support us to become better people. So when we come and we relax at home, we would love who we have become. God, we leave this place with that hope, knowing that you are the all-powerful God who can make us one with you, like you, who can help us also as a church to become one, a place where every one of us can become more like you. Make us that place, Jesus, is our prayer. We love you.